Hello and welcome to this video. Um, if you only watch two videos about this novel, um, you should watch this one on chapter one and my other one on the final chapter because this is where you can most appreciate the author's craft. Um, in the final chapter, you always get the author's point of view. Uh, and then actually, it's really useful skill to reread the first chapter once you've got to the end of a novel and ask yourself, why did the author begin the novel this way? So I'm going to show you lots of moments where really close reading uh, will take you to grade nine and above. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, Ishiguru sets this in England, the late 1990s. So although he's writing about an imagined future where people are cloned, he actually sets it in an imagined past. Um, now, what's subtle about this is he's being quite upfront in his purpose here, because what he's saying is, uh, listen, reader, what I'm telling you about the clones isn't just about the clones in my book. No, the clones represent you in your society, dear reader. So he's asking us the question, are we just like the clones? And at the same time, are we just like the guardians? Well, let's explore that as we read through. My name is Kathy H. I'm 31 years old and I've been a carer now for over 11 years. That sounds long enough, I know, but actually they want me to go on for another eight months until the end of this year. And that will make it almost exactly 12 years. Now, I know my being a carer so long isn't necessarily because they think I'm fantastic at what I do. There are some really good carers who've been told to stop after just two or three years. And I can think of one carer at least who went on for all of 14 years despite being a complete waste of space. So the first question she asks us then is why has she been allowed to be a carer for so long? Um, now, at this stage, we don't know what a carer is. We don't know what a donation is, but in hindsight, of course, we do. So what is it about Kathy's personality that makes them continue to use her? Well, one of the things could be the very thing that annoys so many readers, and that is that she never rebels. Um, she never decides to strike out on her own and live her own life. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that Ishiguru is saying, do any of us do that? How many of us actually choose to live an original and fulfilled life rather than a similar life to everyone else we know? Then when we consider that there are some people who are really good carers who have been stopped after two or three years, perhaps it's because they are not like Kathy they do perhaps start to question things and do start to think about um, their own freedoms. And that brings us to this word here. They have been told to stop. And now that's a euphemism because when you're told to stop caring, you instantly become a donor. In other words, they've been condemned to death uh, at the moment that they're told to stop being a carer. Um, so as soon as uh, clones start to develop, any kind of sense of independence, we assume they are effectively murdered. So Ishiguru deliberately contrasts Kathy with other good carers, and he asks us to work out what the difference is between her and them. Let's read on and find out some differences. So I'm not trying to boast, but then I do know for a fact they've been pleased with my work, and by and large I have too. My donors have always tended to do much better than expected. Their recovery times have been impressive and hardly any of them have been classified as agitated even before fourth donation. OK, maybe I am boasting now, but it means a lot to me being able to do my work well, especially that bit about my donors staying calm. I've developed a kind of instinct around donors. I know when to hang around and comfort them, when to leave them to themselves, when to listen to everything they have to say, and when to just shrug and tell them to snap out of it. So here we get to understand the ruthless nature of her role. Um, 
One is to keep uh, patients recovering uh, through their different um, donations. Uh, so what we've got to understand here is there's no benefit to this society in killing um, a donor and harvesting all of the organs. Uh, why? Well, the organs don't last long. You need somebody to receive them. Um, and so what this society doesn't want is too many organs available at once because they would simply be wasted. Instead, what they need is the organ organs to be produced on demand uh, exactly when uh, somebody needs to receive them. So she's really practical that way at keeping um, more organs in, um, in this market, if you like. Um, but the other thing she's done is stopped any kind of rebellion. Look at the words in quotation marks, agitated and calm. So her job is to stop her patients rebelling. Well, why does Ishiguru focus on that, especially with the quotation marks, to draw our attention to it? Well, these are the things that we would expect Kathy to become. We'd expect her to be agitated, but instead she stays calm. In other words, in order to do her job well, she has to cease to be fully human. Um, she simply gives in to the demands of the role. So here Ishiguru is asking us, um, if our society does that to us, are we just uh, drugged, if you like, um, by social convention to follow what everybody else does? Anyway, I'm not making any big claims for myself. I know carers working now who are just as good and don't get half the credit. If you're one of them, I can understand how you might get resentful about my bedsit, my car, above all, the way I get to pick and choose who I look after. And I'm a Hailsham student, which is enough by itself sometimes to get people's backs up. Kathy H, they say. She gets to pick and choose, and she always chooses her own kind, people from Hailsham or one of the other privileged estates. So again, Ishiguru uses contrast and juxtaposition. Uh, so we've got this idea of privilege here, and he deliberately uses the word estates rather than uh, centres or schools that Hailsham was, because he wants us to link um, her experience to class. So partly this is ironic, isn't it? Because we associate a privileged estate with um, a large landowner, perhaps a lord with a, a huge country estate. Uh, but this is contrasted with what she actually has, which is a bedsit and a car, um, very um, small possessions. However, these mean so much to her, and partly he does this to condemn the society that gives the clones so little, um, you know, even if it allows them to live, they get such few possessions. And indeed, by definition, all the other carers must get less than she does. Uh, so again, Ishiguru is asking us, um, is she given this relative freedom of a car and her own independence, her own room? Um, so presumably the other uh, carers must live communally together and they might have to share transport or take public transport. We don't know. They're not giving that independence, perhaps because they might rebel. Um, but because Kathy shows herself to be so calm and so lacking in rebellion or passion, um, she is allowed greater freedoms. And she associates this with being superior to other carers because she gets to pick and choose who to look after. And I think there's another quite um, horrible historical reference going on here. So if we think about the Nazi concentration camps where uh, millions of people were exterminated, um, it was very difficult for the Germans with few, uh, few staff um, to manage this industrial slaughter on their own. And so what they do is promote um, a few key people to be, if you like, carers. Their job was to usher um, their fellow Jews or inmates into um, the gas chambers um, as though they were going to have showers um, and then um, bring out the bodies again once they'd been murdered. So these, uh, these inmates that would fully know what was going to happen to the victims 
whereas uh, we might argue that the victims didn't. Uh, but they were complicit in this in order to prolong their own life or, if you like, in order to make the last moments of um, uh, these poor people better. I mean, you know, would you rather go to your death um, knowing that it was coming and dreading it as you went or would you rather it to be a sudden surprise? Um, that would certainly be the rationale that they would um, use to justify what they were doing. And here, Kathy does the same thing. Uh, she gives them a longer life by making them calm and less agitated, keeping them alive for longer donations. Uh, so she can see what she's doing as offering hope, even though we know it's a hope that will eventually be taken away uh, by state murder. And then Ishiguru uh, gives us this all-important detail that um, she is a Hailsham student. Uh, and we know that Hailsham is made up of hail. Um, this would be uh, a Roman greeting uh, that's uh, come back into, um, into English uh, that refers to someone's status. So she is hailed because she is um, above other people, socially superior. Uh, privileged, remember, but she is also a sham. Um, so it's not just Hailsham that's a sham, you know, this thing that appears to be a school that cares for the children, but is actually just breeding them for industrial slaughter. Uh, she is also a sham um, as a carer, because actually all she's doing is um, making it easier for this society um, to use clones in this way. No wonder she has a great record. I've heard it said enough, so I'm sure you've heard it plenty more, and maybe there's something in it. But I'm not the first to be allowed to pick and choose, and I doubt if I'll be the last. And anyway, I've done my share of looking after donors brought up in every kind of place. By the time I finish, remember, I'll have done 12 years of this, and it's only for the last six that they've let me choose. So we can see that there's a competition amongst the, the um, carers. They're desperate for the approval of society. Um, she's got a great record, which they're jealous of. Uh, but we've also got this rather chilling detail, uh, which we'll get onto in a minute, that she's been choosing her victims, if you like, for the last six years. Well, we could say that she's doing them a service because she keeps them alive longer. Uh, but uh, we can also see her deliberately picking students who've been at Hailsham and killing them off. Um, this is the ultimate power grab. She's going to be the last member of Hailsham left alive. Um, it's, in a sense, her attempt to become queen. And as we get into the novel, uh, we can see that Ruth has had this privileged status, uh, certainly within her friendship group. But now... Uh, we can see Kathy ruthlessly picking off um, everyone else and literally executing them or leading them towards execution. Now, she's doing it in a humane way by making them donate as much as possible because in her own mind, it needs to be seen as a kindness. But Ishiguru, uh, heavy on the irony here, is suggesting that this is an illusion. It is a sham. This is part of her being a sham carer, because actually she's deliberately seeking out uh, all these people from her past and killing them off. And we're also building up a sense of how deeply unpleasant she is. So not only is she boastful, despite all her claims that she's not, um, we can see that now she's um, disgusted, if you like, by donors who come from a different class, a different estate. Look, and anyway, I've done my share of looking after donors brought up in every kind of place. You can see from her um, choice of language here, kind of place, that she's saying that they are not my kind. They're not superior like me. Um, and, and later in this chapter, we'll see how other places are different to Hailsham. So she actually sees these other clones as inferior to her kind of clone. Um, the class system is very much alive in her mind. So here Ishiguru is asking us whether um, all human experience is like this. If you travel to any society in the world, 
is it ever equal or is it always based on a class system of privilege? Um, if it is, then he's saying something fundamental about human nature. And that is that we need, in order to have a pleasant and enjoyable life, to feel superior to others. And for that to happen, we have to make sure that other people are inferior to us. In other words, human nature is essentially one that relies on conflict, prejudice and hierarchies. Uh, so he's asking us, are we all, in fact, as deeply unpleasant as Kathy? And his next question is, if we are, are we also fooling ourselves, as Kathy does, that we're actually nice people, when really we're not? And why shouldn't they? Let me choose, she means. Carers aren't machines. <coughs> you try and do your best for every donor, but in the end it wears you down. You don't have unlimited patience and energy. So when you get a chance to choose, of course, you choose your own kind. That's natural. There's no way I could have gone on for as long as I have if I'd stopped feeling for my donors every step of the way. And anyway, if I'd never started choosing, how would I ever have got close again to Ruth and Tommy after all those years? Again, this paragraph is laced with irony. Uh, so when she says carers aren't machines, uh, actually, uh, another way of interpreting that is they are. They are part of this... Um, huge machine that generates clones then kills them harvesting their audio, uh, their organs one at a time that is an industrial machinery uh, that um, churns out dead people at exactly the right time uh, matched to exactly the right people who need the organs um, then we look at her language so when you get a chance to choose of course you choose your own um, kind of course here means it seems entirely natural to her, but Ishiguru uses that ironically. It's not of course at all. Why would you choose people who are just like you? Well, the only reason is because you're obsessed with your own kind. You've got this class obsession uh, of social division and hierarchy. And when she says that's natural, that's her justification to herself. But um, Ishiguru is asking a twofold question. Should that be natural? Should we be addicted to this kind of idea of social class and privilege? And uh, if we are, then that's what's wrong with human nature. Um, for example, if we did treat all humans as equal and we didn't have this inbuilt social hierarchy, we could never clone other humans. We couldn't use other humans in this way because any human life would be just as valuable as our own. Um, so uh, there's a double irony here where Ishiguru is saying, yeah, that is natural. That's what it means to be human. We treat other humans as though they are totally inferior to us, so inferior that they are actually disposable and human life doesn't have any value. Uh, then we've got this idea of uh, she would have given up long before uh, if she'd uh, stopped feeling for my donors. So implicit in that is she can't feel fully for these donors who come from other schools because they are so inferior, they are so unlike her, they're not even as human as she is in her own mind. Uh, and then we've got this rather chilling image at the end. If I'd never started choosing, how would I ever have got close again to Ruth and Tommy after all those years? Um, and this idea of have got close is, if you like, from the semantic field um, of hunting. The idea that she's seeking out her victims, hunting them down without spooking them. Um, uh, anyway, that's my interpretation. Let's carry on. But these days, of course, there are fewer and fewer donors left who I remember. And so in practice, I haven't been choosing that much. As I say, the work gets a lot harder when you don't have that deeper link with the donor. And though I'll miss being a carer, it feels just about right to be finishing at last come the end of the year. So this is really interesting because um, she has made a decision to become a donor herself. So in effect, um, she's calling time on life. Uh, it's a slow suicide. She's got to donate. But she has chosen this moment. 
and if we go back to the first paragraph um she says but actually they want me to go on for another eight months so she has chosen to give up but she's so useful to this society as a killing machine if you like that they want her to keep going in the job um perhaps we can uh, look at this eight months and uh, infer that they deliberately haven't chosen nine months um, this is an allusion to the fact that um, the clones can't have babies nine months would be the gestation period and she is cut just short of that um, so death is the opposite of rebirth here uh, there's going to be no heaven uh, and it also alludes to the fact that she can never have children and uh, neither can the other clones it is if you like an ironic reference to how cruel this society is the first encounter that we have with Ruth is also therefore laced with irony so Ruth incidentally was only the third or fourth donor I got to choose uh, she already had a carer assigned to her at the time and I remember it taking a bit of nerve on my part um, so she's deliberately um, managed to use her influence to get rid of one carer in order that she herself can get rid of Ruth but in the end I managed it um, and so we've got this use of the word end here linking it through the semantic field of death um, with Ruth so she's letting us know that Ruth's death is uppermost on her mind when she apparently chooses to care for Ruth and the instant I saw her again at the recovery center in Dover uh, all our differences while they didn't exactly vanish seemed not nearly as important as all the other things I'm going to draw your attention to the world the word seemed and how they didn't exactly vanish in other words try as Kathy might she can't escape the differences uh, that she had with Ruth and we don't know what these differences are yet but this is clearly a revenge killing for the differences and she's reframing it in another way uh, and saying that all the other things the things that we had in common outweighed our differences but actually that's a lie it's the differences that have made her seek Ruth out um, so that she can execute her and watch her die once we get to the end of the novel of course we can chart many betrayals um, that Ruth has uh, inflicted upon Kathy but the main betrayal of course is uh, Ruth stealing Tommy for, from her and then the added insult of making Kathy get Tommy to go back out with Ruth again once they've split up so Ruth if you like is ruthless uh, she is uh, completely um, manipulative um, and I think uh, Ishiguru has chosen the word Ruth uh, to make her ruthless to remind her, us of her ruthlessness um, and then the final irony of how ruthless Kathy is when she gets rid of Ruth in other words Kathy is ruthless without Kathy uh, sorry without Ruth uh, when she executes Ruth now you might think this is too far-fetched an interpretation but bear with me look at this bit here uh, it's ever since then I suppose I started seeking out for my donors people uh, for my donors people from the past and whenever I could people from Hailsham so what we've got here is her being able to choose donors earlier based on some other criteria that she doesn't tell us but once she has executed Ruth who has come from Hailsham she now starts to seek out other people who have come from Hailsham so she is deliberately avenging herself on the whole social circle and this of course makes her the most important Hailsham survivor if not the last she has the power of life and death over them all and the extreme pleasure we infer that she gets from watching them die and when you get to the end of the novel there's only one Hailsham donor who manages to rebel against this and it's Tommy 
he refuses to allow uh, Kathy to watch him die. And that is probably because he has worked out where Kathy's pleasures lie. Um, he has worked out that she's deceiving herself, that she's merely caring for her donors. He knows that she's taking some vicarious pleasure from watching them die. So I hope you've uh, gained a deep insight into what Ishiguru is up to here and also into the rather um, duplicitous character of Kathy, uh, how she even deceives herself about her true intentions, but how through the use of irony um, and juxtaposition and contrast, Ishiguru shows us what a deeply unpleasant human being she is. And even worse for us as readers, by extension, he is implying we are all like this, all deceiving ourselves about our true intentions, but actually addicted to social hierarchy, addicted to prejudice, uh, always favouring our own kind at the expense of others that we view as inferior. How's that for a dystopian novel? <laughs> Good luck with your revision, uh, and in my next videos, I will take you through the rest of the chapter.